that had a detrimental effect on our ability to sell the centres and it meant that we left some money behind. Um, that's, a, that's a really sort of good example, a good actual live example of, you know, where um, you make a mistake and, and like you, Elise, I sort of think of them not as terminal, never do that again episodes. I think of it as we've now paid for a lesson. Yeah. It would be silly if we don't take that knowledge and then do the next one properly. Hello and welcome to Trillions. I'm your host, Elise Grace, and today I'm chatting with Queensland millionaire, property investor Don O'Rourke. Don founded Consolidated Properties 40 years ago and builds almost anything from billion dollar urban renewals to residential high rises. On this episode, Don shares the importance of maintaining good business and political relationships, some learnings from early mistakes, and specific tips for risk identification and mitigation. This is a great lesson for anyone, especially those interested in property. I do apologize for the audio on this one. Bear with me while I work out a solution for these remote interviews. Enjoy. Thank you, Don O'Rourke, for joining me on the podcast. You're the uh, CEO and chairman and one of the founding members of Consolidated Properties Group. Thank you very much for joining me on the podcast today. My pleasure, Elise. Thank you for asking me to come on the podcast. You're welcome. So um, Consolidated Properties has developed a multitude of, of, of developments. You, you don't hold back in developing um, retail, hotels, industrial, high rises. Um, is there anything that you don't do, Don? Um, well, at least pro- probably the best way of describing it is we've done all of the things you've mentioned, probably plus, plus a few more categories. Like we have been pub owners, we've operated restaurants and rec clubs and things like that over the years. Over a 40-year period, we've done all those things, but we're a lot more focused at the moment. Um, when I say at the moment, you know, probably for the last seven or eight years, we've, we've tried to focus on just a couple of key areas, retail, office buildings, and uh, apartments and land and residential. Okay. And uh, what's the reason for that? Uh, is, is it something to do with he who chases two rabbits, catches none, or anything to do with narrowing your focus so you can put more uh, quality into those works? What's the reason for it? Look, I guess we were very adventurous and very inquisitive, you know, in our early days, and we chased, like, a lot more than two rabbits. Uh, yeah. We probably chased many rabbits. But as you get older and you've done more and more projects, um, I, I guess you start to feel which areas you believe you have the best competencies in. And that's really why we've narrowed the field down to, you know, a, a few sort of specialised areas. Okay, that makes sense. And you, you guys have been around for decades. Uh, is, it, is it 40 plus years now, Don? Yep, so last year we celebrated at least our 40 years in business. Um, Consolidated Properties was founded in Brisbane 40 years ago. Um, and, and as I say, over that period, we've done literally hundreds of projects. And... Um, those projects have occurred as far north as Cooktown and as far south as Phillip Island and as far west as um, Emerald. And we've actually done some stuff in Bali and in Japan as well over that time. So we've covered a lot of ground in the 40 years. Yeah, cool. Very cool. What were you doing in, um, in Bali and Japan? So in Japan, um, Scott Hutchinson and I, he's the chair of Hutchinson Builders, Mm-hmm. Um, we bought um, a resort, small resort site in Nisiko, which is a ski village um, on the northern island of Hokkaido, and, uh, and we constructed a, um, a 37 apartment complex with um, ski rental, restaurant, and all those sort of things, which we sold to Australian investors. Uh, Hachi and I kept a couple of apartments there, which we still go and visit. Um, so that was a bit of an affair of the heart as well as of the head. But like all things, it had a sort of nice but funny ending. We settled it, settled the completed apartments just as the GFC arrived, 2008. So sometimes you get lucky. Great timing. Yeah, yeah Hachi- I'd say planning, but I think it was just luck. Yeah. Hachi told me um, you guys uh, knew the, the, the people requesting that you developed, that you guys developed it over there because um, uh, they, wanted, they wanted Australian developers to be completing that project in Japan, in Japan. Um, so that, that's really cool. All right. And, um, and where did you get your, your roots done? So tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, I read, 
um, that you're a bit of a boarding school naughty boy. Um, and then <laughs> you, you created and founded Consolidated Properties in your, in your 20s. So tell us a bit about yeah. how you got started and, uh, and, and how this all came about. What, your, what was your first project as well? Surely. So, um, so I was brought up in Esk in the Brisbane Valley. Um, I came down to boarding school when I was age 11, um, Brisbane Boys College at Tuong, and that's where I met Scott Hutchinson, and we've been lifelong friends and business partners um, for 35 of those 40 years we've been in business. But uh, after finishing school, I did a business degree at QUT, um, and my first job was with what is now CBRA. Um, back then it was Ray Wright Richard Ellis um, and I ran the commercial leasing division. Um, so while I was at um, CBRE, I sort of figured that we found the tenant, we found the site, we packaged it up and then we take it to a developer to do that. And I sort of figured there might be one too many people in that transaction. Why not cut the developer out and do it ourselves? So we, a couple of us got together, there were five of us originally, four of us from CBRE and an architect. And we did a little office building at Lutwich, which Westpac leased from us before we started. Um, that was our very first project. I was 22 years old um, and we just made money. What that really proved to me was how little we actually knew of the process. Um, so I left CBRE and joined Don Cunnington, um, who was a prominent architect and developer in that time, or at that time. And I had 12 months working for a developer um, to really get to know how the process of development worked properly. So, you know, at the right old age of I don't know, 23, I knew everything. <laughs> yeah. So I left uh, Don's employment and, uh, and really ran consolidated properties full time from that point onwards. Um, the enduring lesson out of the CBRE times were, was that if you look after the occupant of the building, so our first project was Westpac, as was our second project, incidentally. Yeah. Um, we looked after Westpac's needs and we were able to build a property transaction around accommodating the occupant's needs. That philosophy has stuck with us for our entire um, commercial life. In our residential business, we always start from the premise of who is going to be our occupant, and what does that occupant want, and if we satisfy that need, we can then again build a successful transaction back from there. Um, and that's a key sort of ethos of our business. Um, as I mentioned right at the beginning of the podcast, we were young and adventurous, so we thought we'd have a go at everything. We did some office, we did some residential, we did some retail, we did some industrial, we did resorts. We sort of just wanted to have a go. And we were curious, uh, we were energetic, we were risk takers. And that led us through a whole bunch of different projects um, over the 40 year period. Um, but again, I know I'm repeating myself a little bit here, but every one of those has had the occupant as our principal um, driver. They're our customer and we have to look after that customer. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So um, yeah, some businesses run by the, the philosophy that the customer is always right. And I guess um, that's, that's what you're saying in a, in a roundabout way with your properties. You're making sure that um, me as a resident in this high rise apartment is going to enjoy the amenities and the layout and the finishes and, and those kinds of things. So yeah, that's really cool that you think about that. What, what do you do Don, when you come into contact with a, a client who doesn't so much have the customer or the um, occupant in mind uh, and you, you may bump heads there. How do you go about changing their philosophies to align with, with yours when it comes to how you want to do the build for them? So I, I, I guess Elise, the customer, we, we are only the only ones that deal with the customer. Oh, um, yes, yeah. so, so the team follows us into that transaction, but in order for us to satisfy the customer's needs, we've got to make sure we, um, as, a, as a team, are coherent in our approach to satisfying those needs. So the second philosophy we have is that we're quite happy for um, people in our transactions to make a dollar for a dollar's worth of work. So we, we figure we need to be an informed client, so we need to know what we're doing. We need to give them enough money and enough time to do the job. And I'm particularly thinking about Hutchies in this example, where um, some people engage a builder through a tender process, highly adversarial, 
and they're looking to make money by making the builder lose money. We are at the opposite end of that um, spectrum. We want the builder to make money. We want the builder to do a good job. We want to give them one set of documents, not 10 set of documents, so they get good productivity. And we want to make sure they've got enough time to do the job. If we do that, they'll give us a really good performance. And, uh, and in turn, that good performance enables us to meet our occupants' needs. So we apply that philosophy to everyone that inputs into our projects, from architects and engineers. When we go to set the financing for the projects, we have that approach with the banks and with our equity providers and our junior debt providers. We figure as an informed client, we know what the price should be. And if they're prepared to match what is a market price or give us a market price, we're happy to transact without having to go to tender. So it's all about working coherently as a team, being productive, know what you're doing. And then everyone walks away from the transaction saying that was a good experience. We've got what we expected. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it's incredible that you've maintained that integrity and approach for, for 40 plus years and you guys are still thriving in business. Um, how, how have you been able to navigate the landscape at the moment with the, um, the coronavirus and everything going on? Are you, are you still, um, has it made you guys slow down at all or how are you going? Oh, most definitely, Lisa. I mean, so for us, so we have a business in shopping centres. Um, we have eight centres which have hundreds of tenants. So our experience right at the moment is that... Um, Probably a bit off-putting, uh, not being able to see who you're talking to, right? No, but I think if, I'll just keep going if you like. Um, so as you would expect, Woolworths and Coles, um, their turnover is way up at the moment some 70% up in most of the centres. Um, so they have no problem paying their rent and, uh, and we're looking to meet their needs by upping the cleaning, upping the security and those sorts of things. Yeah. At the other end of the spectrum, um, the nail shop um, and those sorts of tenants are completely shut down. So we're working with them, we're rebating 100% of the rent to them. We're, we're not collecting their rent, I should say. Um, and we're working with them to reopen when this crisis passes. So we're, we're collecting more than half of, uh, of, of our normal rents out of our shopping centres because we are basically um, uh, convenience-based retailing, non-discretionary specialty shop tenants. Yeah. Um, so that, that continues um, for us. Um, we also have the support of our banks. So our banks are continuing to pay us uh, our drawdowns and we are continuing to pay Hutchies. So, Oh, Hutchies is very keen to keep building sites open, which keeps subcontractors employed and keeps um, families being paid. So that, I guess, pathway of money from capital providers through us as the developer to the builders is keeping our construction sites going. Um, but looking around the landscape, um, you know, I'm working from an office in the city. We're one of the only tenants still at work. I drive into work. There's hardly anyone on the road. So the environment we're operating from is, is very, very different um, to what it was, you know, say in December last year. But for our business, um, you know, we're continuing to, to move forward. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear that, that uh, it's, it's almost business as, not, as usual for you guys and, and um, most families are still putting meals on tables. That's good to hear and, and interesting how you guys are approaching it and managing it. Um, so... So as uh, you said before, and, and we were discussing, you guys have been in business over 40 years and um, you're, you're still a privately owned company. Um, it's been said that there's, there's smaller-ish margins in construction. So how do you guys stay a private, privately owned company, much like Hutchies, um, considering the so-called small margins in, in property? So where would um, the majority of your, your cash flow come from? So, Lisa, I guess the first thing is um, we're, a, and this might sound very simplistic, but we're a developer and Hutchies is a builder. So, the builders um, work on a net margin of about 2%. So, I mean, Hutchies has, you know, well-published accounts and, and their sort of rough metric, if you like, is $3 billion of turnover engaging $300 million of capital to make $30 million. Yeah. Um, so they'll make one or two percent, thirty to sixty million dollars a year. Um, development has a different metric altogether. 
development works on um, a margin of about 15%. So the margin is expressed as a marker. So if you add up all the costs, add on 15%, mm -hmm. that's what you sell the project for. Um, and you hope to make a, a, a profit margin of about 15%. Now, that may sort of, you know, with contingencies being used and a few things going wrong, come down to 10%. But um, that's the sort of range that you can expect out of development. Um, development is, is a highly leveraged business. Uh, private developers work on a, on a debt uh, to cost ratio of about 60 to 70%. Um, so we engage a lot more debt where the builders don't engage the debt. So, so for us, um, if we get it right, it can be profitable and our balance sheet increases by retained earnings each year, but the retained earnings will never be enough to fund an expanding workbook. So we look to engage third party capital to enable our projects. So our general modus operandi is we use our money to secure the sites, get the approvals, get the Hutchie price sorted out, get some pre-sales, some pre-leasing, get all the debt in place. When we've got that, we'll bring in an external capital provider in the form of mezzanine debt or preferred equity, and that will enable us then to do these larger projects. Um, and usually the arrangement we have with those providers is we put our money in first and we take our money out last and they'll get a return um, of somewhere around 15 to 20%, um, the uh, mezzanine or, or prep equity providers. Um, and that enables us to do, to have like a $2 billion pipeline off, off a relatively small um, balance sheet. Yeah, but you've got skin in all the games. So um, people, third parties you're looking to bring in can see that you're committed to what you're doing and, um, and obviously skin in the game means you're serious and uh, you're willing to take that risk. So. That's a, that's a great model. Yeah, absolutely. We, we couldn't raise capital if we didn't have a significant amount of our money in ranking behind um, the third party capital providers. So like, as I say, first money in, last money out is our adage. Yeah. Um, and, and on that basis, the, those third party capital providers are happy to participate. So long as we've also de-risked it, you know, we've got to have DA, we've got to have Hutchie blocked away, we've got to have some pre-sales. Or if we've de-risked it in that manner, it's pretty easy for us to raise third-party capital. Yeah. And um, what's, a, what's some projects, done that you, or what's a project that you probably haven't been able to take much money out of at the end of the, at the, end of the day or, um, or any at all? Uh, and what did you learn from that? Uh, project, you could call it a failure, but I like calling it a, an, a learning experience. So what's one of those <laughs> major learning experiences you've had? Maybe it happened in the early days, maybe it's something recent, but what's a memorable one for you? Well, look, um, when you sort of go into a new sector, so Elise, I spoke earlier about how we started off doing a little office building and then we tried some apartments and then shopping centres. You know, when you do the first one of those new projects, you know, you do your best to do all of the research, but invariably you get something wrong. So the best example I can think of in that is um, we did a couple of regional shopping centres. Um, and I won't tell you which country towns they were in because I want to make sure I protect That's okay. the um, current owners, um, uh, you know, assets. But we put too many specialty shops against a Coles or a Woolworths. Um, and what that did, it meant we built something that had a vacancy in perpetuity. And that made it difficult to sell. So we came into that sector, we thought we had it right, we finished the building, and those last six shops we just couldn't rent. That had a detrimental effect on our ability to sell the centres, and it meant that we left some money behind. Um, that's, a, that's a really sort of good example, a good, actual live example of you know where um you make a mistake and, and like you Elise, i sort of think of them not as terminal never do that again episodes i think of it as we've now paid for a lesson yeah we would be silly if we don't take that knowledge and then do the next one properly so with the shopping centers we've gone on to do i don't know 45 of them or something like that and, and we've used those early learnings to make our performance better oh that's great it's uh it's always good when somebody learns the first time and doesn't repeat mistakes. So that's, um, that's great to hear. Why do you think a lot of developers 
fail. Uh, I've seen, obviously, I've lived in Brisbane over 10 years. I've seen a lot of um, um, buildings go up, which is fantastic. There's a lot of growth happening in Brisbane. It's great to see. Uh, but there's been a lot of, uh, some stories I've heard of developers going bankrupt or um, um, losing lots of money, especially with the apartment game. So why do you think this happens, maybe even specifically in Brisbane? So, well, I, I guess if I can talk to it from our approach, and that may be a way of answering the question. So we believe development is a business of, of risk identification and risk mitigation. And we think there are four or five key risks. There's the planning risk, so that's the risk. The mitigant is get a DA. Yep. There's the delivery risk, um, which is how much is it going to cost, when's it going to be finished, all those sort of things. The mitigant is to have a lump sum, fixed price, design and construct, fixed time contract with a reputable, experienced builder like Hutchie. So that's delivery risk. Um, there's leasing risk. Have you got sufficient pre-leases in place? There's um, settlement risk, which is if it, in an apartment building, have you got enough pre-sales? Um, there's feasibility risk. Have you used valuation instead of some, you know, um, optimistic revenue projection? So um, there's risks and there's mitigants. Now, a, a good project is one where you've ticked all of the mitigant boxes. So why do other people have a problem? If you sort of believe that risk mitigation um, strategy, they won't have mitigated all of their risks. They might have bought a site without getting a DA and then they, all of a sudden they find that the council's not going to let them have 15 levels, it's only going to let them have 10 levels. They might have uh, entered into a contract with the lowest tender and that builder goes broke halfway through. Mm -hmm. um, they might have got some pre-sales but hadn't done a proper analysis on the stock that was remaining and was overpriced or, you know, faced west or looked into the wall of an apartment building next door or, you know, something like that. Yeah. So generally they haven't really thought through the risks and properly mitigated them. Um, the end result, they go broke. Right. Okay, well, wow, there's lots to think about. It's more than just um, it's more than just putting some money together and, and building something. And there's a lot to think about uh, in, in in having a successful outcome with these projects. Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing your your mitigating tips. Hopefully, uh, our audience can take something from them from somebody like yourself. Uh, so, Don, it's it's known that you're um you're encouraging of women in the workplace, and you you have a fun workspace as well. So, I'd love to hear. Uh, a bit about both of those so what kind of workspace do you have there i can see your boardroom um but um how do you create a fun work environment you've got staff who've been with you for 10 plus years um and um obviously yeah touch on women in the workplace as well what value do you think they, they bring so it's a two-part question so uh, i guess lisa i'll start with the women in the workplace uh, i mean we have quite a number of our um senior team members are women um and look I have a sort of funny view of that. I mean, I think that's not really that important. I mean, those people are really good at their job. The fact that they happen to be a woman should have no bearing on, on us employing them for that reason. Um, as it turns out, on merit, quite a few of our senior people are women. And I'd like to think, as a community, we're getting a bit beyond that argument yeah. of saying you have to employ your, because you're a woman. I think a much better argument is there are, very, there are a lot of very competent women in our industry. Why you, wouldn't they have whatever job they should be? Do you think perhaps um, women don't put themselves out there enough uh, or back themselves perhaps as much as men do? I, I get the feeling that this, this is sometimes an issue. Look, it, it could be, but again, I, I'm a real believer in women's ability to do things. And, and I just don't think we should be making the statement, oh, she's a woman, she can do that, as though that's an abnormal thing. Mm. I mean, you know, women are very talented across each, each of the fields in this industry. We shouldn't be employing them because of merit. And unsurprisingly, you know, more than half of them are women. Like, but it shouldn't really be um, a relevant thing. Women are smart, women are good at running jobs, they should be employed on their merit not based on whether they're male or female. And, and I think that is the circumstance we find ourselves in after we've gone through 
recognising that women needed to be encouraged and getting them to position to that position. I actually think we're starting to transition past that, mm. uh, and we're a much more mature um, industry to recognise merit as the thing that will get people um, jobs. So we've always said that. I mean, my general manager has been in that role for more than 20 years. The most senior person in the organisation behind me is the female. Um, you know, marketing comms manager Chelsea is female. Um, so, yeah, we've got, we've got a lot of people in, in those sorts of roles. Um, and they do a great job. And, wow, what a surprise. They're a woman. You know, like, it, uh, it, it shouldn't really even enter the conversation, in my view. Um, yeah. So I guess... And, and again, I, I am repeating myself a little bit, but I think that just recognises the level of maturity in the discussion now. Mm. Um, I think it's a it's a real positive for for where our industries come from. And you can see, looking at the large listeds with the head of Mervac, um, second most senior person in Lend Lease, um, Stockland. Um, you know, there are a lot of women leading big companies in our sector now. And again, I know I'm. I, Repeating myself, but what surprise, surprise. Like, you know, and of course it should be so. Yeah. Um, because they are talented people and their merit will get them there. The fact that they're a woman is not really relevant. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's uh, a great point. And uh, fun yeah. workplace, what, what do you guys like to do? What are a few things that you do to create a fun working environment for your staff? Well, um, first of all, our office. So our office is at 175 Eagle Street. Um, this was a building we developed um, probably 15 years ago. Um, we sold it on completion to a Macquarie Bank fund and Macquarie then sold the platform to Charter Hall. And Charter Hall Office Fund still owns the building. Um, so we're sort of a big believer in um, eating our own cooking, I think that's the phrase. <laughs> um, so we're, uh, we're actually in one of our own buildings. Um, the fit out, and you can see a little bit of it here, you can sort of see the timber flooring and things like that. The yeah. design was done by John Wardle, um, and John Wardle is a Melbourne architect who arguably is the best design architect in Australia at the moment. I mean, arguably, that's a very subjective call. Yeah. But when we were doing the Spire Apartments, which is just around the corner in Queen Street, um, John did that building for us um, and we said to John at the time, look, why don't you also design our new office fit out? So he did the fit out here prior to us starting on site with Spire. Uh, and there's a lot of really nice different ideas that he's put into this. So, um, so what the office says about us is that we're interested in design, we're interested in quality, we're interested in backing uh, our own products. We're still in a building that we completed 15 years ago. Um, and it's a very egalitarian office. Uh, no one has an office. Everyone's in workstations. My workstation is exactly the same as everyone else's. Um, and that has been the case in our organisation for more than 10 years now. Yeah. Um, so that sort of says about the egalitarian nature of the business, the flat structure, Fact that everyone can contribute, no one, um, you know, can feel they shouldn't contribute to any subject in the organisation. Um, so that's the culture of the place. I think what that's meant is we've been really good at staff retention, but equally we've also pursued a policy of bringing young people into the organisation each year so that we continue to sort of harness the energy of youth, if you like. Yeah. And we also get to have um, the experience of you know, the lend leases of the world um, coming in so we can add to our knowledge set as an organisation. We, we don't ever want to be insular. We want to continue to evolve um, and we want to try and stay at the, at the cutting edge of products we're producing and the ways we go about doing it, um, which is difficult. Like I'm 60 shortly in a couple of months' time and to, to do that, you really it gets harder as you get older. So my approach is to recognise that yeah. and look to make sure we've got lots of people coming in that can add that energy, that vibrancy and that currency um, to the thinking. Um, one of the things we sort of value is health. Um, so uh, we pay for uh, personal trainers for everyone that wants to go. Um, we also pay for people to do an annual medical if they want to go. So we're interested in people staying healthy. Um, very rarely will you see someone eating a hot chip and gravy sandwich in the uh, 
in the boardroom, except if it's uh, after a big night out when people do need cheap and gravy sandwiches and yeah. Coca-Cola. Yeah. <laughs> um, but generally, a, pie, a pie and a Coke will <laughs> sort them out. Next exactly, week. exactly. So, um, so, yeah, so we, uh, we sort of have fun, you know, there's lots of drink nights and, um, and you know, when times are good, we do some interesting trips, you know, over the years in between recessions, we've done company trips to Dubai and, um, and to Singapore and Vietnam and places is that, is like that. that. The whole team goes, yeah. Oh, cool. So, so when, they, uh, when they hit their um, targets, they, they, you take them on trips? Yeah, or, or we take the whole organisation on a trip if we've all done well. There's a bit of a sort of one in all in type philosophy. Yeah. Um, and then conversely, in times like these, when we've all got to, you know, buckle down and watch the dollars and, you know, be productive, you know, we, we can do that because we've got a really good team ethos um, in the organisation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've been, I, I guess it's really been about trying to encourage an egalitarian um, atmosphere, one that values everyone's inputs, and then um, let's have a beer or a glass of bubbles on Friday and have some fun. No, oh, that sounds great. Uh, and the seating arrangement sounds like you've got a, a community vibe there and you're, um, you're embracing of the young energy and also the staff have been with you for a long time. And um, at the end of the day, when you all go on trips, it's, it's a team effort. So that sounds, that sounds like a great place to work. Um, yeah, yeah. You've, you've done well to what, what about saying is, is whenever everyone says, oh, yeah, you've done a good job on this or that or the other thing, I always say it's always a good team effort. I mean, it's not one person and it's not just our organisation. A team effort for us is, you know, the Hutchies team, the architects, the engineers, the sales agents, the bankers. We all come together as a team to deliver outcomes. Yeah, there's a lot of people involved in making a project successful. Um, and that's good yeah. to acknowledge. There's, I think it's important as a leader to acknowledge um, that uh, you know, a lot of people say I'm a self-made man um, and this is the company I've built, but it's, it's always a team effort with anything. Um, even myself going through life, I've got a partner and uh, we help each other out and, um, and we credit each other for that. So that's a nice, beautiful thing. All right. Um, yeah. I'd love to chat about invest. What was that, Don? And stay humble. And stay humble. Yes, that's important. Yeah. I think it's good to celebrate your wins, but um, find that balance. Um, yeah. I'd love to talk about investing with you, Don. Uh, uh, I'd love to know if you're willing to disclose a bit of your strategies with investing. Obviously, you invest your company's dollars back in projects, and that seems to, to work out well for you guys. You've, um, uh, you know, you, your company is um, turning over billions of dollars each year in projects. Uh, so what's, what's this, an, your investment strategy? Some people love property, some people love stocks. What is it for you? Well, look, um, all of my money is in property. Um, the hungry beast of development consumes lots of capital. Um, so the money stays in, in our projects generally. Um, but look, what, what I would sort of say to people in a wider sense is with property, the general adage of just buy something and don't sell it is a really good one. Um, the first property I ever bought was a little house at, at 101 Annie Street at New Farm. Mm -hmm. And I paid $37,000 for it. Sold it a couple of years later for double that and thought, I am a genius. <laughs> but, you know, if I own 101 Annie Street now, it's probably a one and a half million dollar cottage. Yeah. So, um, you know, I would have just been better off not selling it and hanging on to it. So, so I think one thing with property, and it, and it is a bit of a migrant story. I mean, you know, you hear the, this often attributed to the Greeks or the Chinese, those sorts of migrants that have come to build Australia. Their strategy was just to keep buying a property, a new property every couple of years and don't sell. So I actually think as unsophisticated as that might sound, it's a really good strategy. Um, so that would be the first thing. Um, in terms of investment, there's another adage that buildings depreciate and land appreciates. Sure. So the underlying land is, is the valuable part of an asset. So if you were to pick what the gold medal in, um, in a, a property investment would be, would be uh, a building that sat on a large parcel of land where the land value and the investment value were the same, and you could receive a four, five, six percent uh, running return on it. That would tick an income box, 
and it would tick a capital appreciation box because the land um, would be the thing that goes up. Um, so I guess that they're, they're, I guess, two relatively unsophisticated um, comments. If you want to sort of take the sophistication up a level, um, you can invest in property, again, through either the, um, the REIT structures, which are all listed, which offer great liquidity, yeah. but you can also invest in debt securities through, um, through the managers, such as CVS Lane and Qualitas. Those types of organisations have really skilled teams in picking good developments to go into, and they'll generally show their investors a return of between 10 and 15%. So if you want to sort of take a more sophisticated approach and take a little bit of controlled development risk, um, I'd be certainly talking to the, you know, the CDS team or the, or the Qualitas team about what products they've got. Okay. That's a great plug for those guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We might be a borrower of theirs too. <laughs> oh, great. Well, yeah, I, I'm particularly interested in, um, in investments that allow you to keep, keep liquid. Obviously, in property, you've got a, a solid asset that takes time um, to market and sell. So, um, yeah, the, the REITs and, and whatnot that you mentioned are, are great options. That's great that you guys are working uh, from an office that you built because you can get a feel for it and really uh, understand the, the finishes and how things work and function and then obviously improve on it for buildings to come. Well, the other thing too, Lisa, is you've got to see everyone in the lift who occupies the building with you every day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're answerable to your customers if you haven't uh, done the right thing. So, um, That's great. You've got yeah, I mean, uh, lots of feedback coming in from all your customers every day. Absolutely. So you've got to do the right thing. And, and look, one of the things that's been really great dealing with Hutchie is that Hutchie backs itself for defects and those sorts of things. So they'll come back and... Um, and fix things up well after the warranty period. So again, seeing our customers in the lift, if someone says, you know, there's a leaky window on, uh, on my floor, I know I can ring Scott and say, you know, we've got a bit of an issue here and he'll have a team there to fix it, even say years after the defects liability period finishes. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I like the, the fact that it's a really good message for us to send that we're happy to be in a building we built. Yeah, that's very smart, great move. All right, well, um, I'd love for you, Don, to think of a question you'd like to ask me. Um, flip the interview around just for one question. Um, so what would be something that you'd like to ask me about business, finance, investing, anything like that? So, Elise, you're talking to lots of people at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, when do they think this current health mm -hmm. crisis will pass? And do they believe that economic cost is greater than the health cost or vice versa? Um, the first part, when do they think the economic crisis will pass? Um, in my group, I'm a part of a mentorship group and uh, my mentor and um, some of the chat that's been going on there um, believes that the economic repercussions of the current situation will last for six to 12, maybe even 18 months um, mm -hmm. because the economy has been flipped on its head, really. The government's giving out billions of dollars, not just the Australian government, it's, it's international. Um, no matter what they try to do, they're not going to be able to control everything that happens with people losing jobs and, um, and how people manage their finances, even if they are given handouts to, um, to try to stimulate the economy. So that's, that's the belief that's happening around my circle of influence. The ec economic repercussions of this will last for some time. And then the yeah. second part of your question was, um, uh, what was it, sorry? Is the, economic, is the economic cost worth the health cost? Oh, okay. That's a great question. That's something, that's something I've been asking myself, Don. Um, it's something I can't personally control, so I'm just, I'm just rolling with the rules right now and, and uh, working within them with the, the limitations. Um, I, it's, it's a really tough question, you know. You've, you've got people dying from a virus, um, the, mostly the elderly, uh, do we, there was an argument put forward that perhaps we put the elderly, um, in a safe environment and then the rest of the world continues on, um, as normal. That's been another argument, uh, which hasn't been received very well because most people think that, um, 
have, have said that, you know, the virus spreads quite rapidly, so that wouldn't prevent it. It's, yeah, it's, it's a tough question to answer. Um, if I was to answer, I would probably say, no, I don't believe that the economic um, cost is worth the, the health locking everybody up. Um, yeah. But that's, that's not the call for me to make. Uh, I don't know. I'm not a scientist, so I don't understand all the jargon. And, um, and, and we've not seen a virus like this for many, many years. None, nothing like this in my lifetime. Um, but um, economic crises, Don, are also cyclical. So we probably were due for a market correction. We were in a bull market. So um, whether it was this virus or something else that hit us, I believe that we were due for a market correction anyway. We're overdue, uh, considering they happen every 10 to 20 years to some extent. Yes. So um, who knows? Maybe it's just, a, it's just a coincidence that it's happened like this. Actually, that's a good point, Lisa. I had not thought about the fact that we were due for a correction and now we've got it through a completely unexpected uh, event. So, good answer, Elise. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's, it's a blessing to speak to people like yourself and, um, and, uh, and other wonderful guests I've had on the podcast to, to learn from and um, being part of a, a great group of people who, um, who um, all have the same mentor and talking... Yeah, talking with high-level high, high level minds and uh, just questioning things I think is good in life, not to just accept what's presented to us on the media. And, and uh, I mean, obviously, it's important to abide by the law and, and do things properly, but um, um, questioning things is important, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed our conversation, Lisa. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Don. Uh, before you go, I have one more question, actually. Uh, What's your legacy? What, what do you want to leave after you're gone um, with regards to consolidated properties and also you personally? Well, that's actually a really easy question to answer. So, you know, I've mentioned we've got a couple of these sayings that we use all the time. Mm -hmm. One of them is our legacy is very permanent. Um, every time we put a building up, that building will be part of the urban landscape for at least a generation. So every street you drive down that has one of our buildings, that is our legacy and it's our contribution to say to the urban landscape that um, our community enjoys. So our buildings are our legacy. Um, for me personally, I'd like to think we've left a couple of good ones behind and they might brighten people's days as they're going to work. Well, that's nice. The buildings that is, yeah? The buildings, yes, yeah. yeah. If you're sitting in traffic and you're looking, say, at Spire, as you're coming up Ann Street, Maybe you just say, that's a nice entry to the city. That makes me happy. Yeah. Oh, I do look out at the city from where I live and it's, uh, I love it. I think it's, um, it's gorgeous seeing buildings go up and seeing a, a city grow. That means that there's development. That means there's people moving into the city. Babies have been born, people growing up. And uh, it's, it's a great sign. Not quite, um, yeah. not quite China, but uh, it's good to see. That's right. <laughs> Just right though, just right, Elise. <laughs> right, yeah. All right, thank you so much, Don, for coming on the podcast. And if uh, anybody would like to get in contact with Don, I'll put his details in the description below. Well, thank you, Don. Thanks for giving us some wonderful insights into the construction industry. Um, I look forward to meeting you in person. Yep. When this crisis passes, when this crisis passes, Elise. Thank yeah. you. Perfect. Thank you, Don.